What's going on? Coming. How are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. There go Capo. Come on in the room. Capo, come on in the room. Boy, I tell you, for them people. You ain't eat too much today, did you? No, not really. I've been running around just doing a couple of things. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm going okay. to I'm I'm get something to grub right after this. Okay. Capo, send me a report. There you go. Hey. Capo. What up, bro? What's going on? Chilling, chilling. Listen, I'm so excited to have you gentlemen tonight because, uh, you know, I know you're already familiar with each other, so that's even more beautiful. Mm -hmm. I've been talking to both of you. And uh, I have one more gentleman, Black Rose, who's going to come from the vert, but he has something else going on. So I have another interview with him at a different time. I had another gentleman. Uh, there's so many of y'all out here that have such great information, so sometimes I like to pull you guys together. But I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. I, I definitely would love for you guys to just share with the people tonight a little bit about your background and who you are. For those who have not met you yet, we want to let the people know that we have Imani in the room and we have Kapo. And both of you are in the New York area or from the New York area, from what I read. You know, I'm a native New Yorker, so that's a blessing, you know. And uh, I know that your background has been about music your whole life. Imani, I see that you sung with the uh, boy choir since you've been 13 years old, huh? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, cool. that was, that was, that was, um, that was my introduction to the professional side of the okay. music industry. Everything wow. before that was, you know, just, you know, on the block, talent show, little community center things and stuff like that. But the moment I entered that, that facility, organization I would call it it was it was serious it was a great learning lesson for me excellent excellent and Capo I know you've been on the management side and helping to develop artists and everything uh how did you get into the music industry um it started from when I was 11 my father was uh managing uh artists from Farragut Projects mm -hmm. his name was Ice Shula and that was my first time actually pressing a CD and I was in the room pressing up. We pressed up about 500 CDs that day. And then we went out there on the block and actually was selling the CDs. And that's when I actually fell in love with it to see the independent side of the wow. game from a wow. young age. And that was it for me. And this is where I'm at now. Let's listen. Well, I want you gentlemen to tell people a little bit about who you were before you got in the industry. Who was that little boy? before you even thought about the music industry. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Imani. Just tell the people your name, where you're from, and a little bit about your background. Um, so, I Imani, uh, born and raised in the Bronx. I've lived in, first of the first thing that people need to know, because a lot of people get me confused with a Jersey boy, but I am a, a Bronx native. There's not a neighborhood in the Bronx that I haven't lived in from White Plains Road all the way down, Soundview, South Bronx. What about Lambert? Lambert Project. I've been, I I've been close to Lambert. I what about Boston Road? I lived on up close to Boston Road. I've lived off Eden Wall. I li listen, there's not a place in the Bronx mm. where I have not resided. Simpson Ave, Fox Ave. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, are, Bronx, you're Bronx. Yeah, I'm yeah. Bronx, dude. I'm Bronx, dude. But, um, Life as a kid was interesting. For me, it was interesting because, like I said, I've lived in every, like, my mom's moved every year. Mm. So I got a chance to really, like, see 
what New York really had to offer because I lived in every borough as well. But the bad part about that is I never really felt like I had a block. You know, the one thing that makes New York great is when you're from a block, you're always from that block. No matter if you leave, come back. So, um, you know, I, I always, when people ask me, even though I'm, I'm a Bronx native, they say, yo, where are you from? I just say New York because I've, I've ventured every part of New York and almost every block to me feels like a, a, a part of my block. So that's, wow. that's, that's been my, my, my younger years. Your family from New York or your parents? My whole family's from New York. Whole family's from New York. Uh, my mother's side, a lot of them from Astoria, Queens, Hollis. Um, my father's side, Spanish Harlem, Bronx. Wow. So, yeah, I'm, I'm a New York native. You no matter New what, York for real, for real. Like, no matter where I, I go. Yeah, no matter yeah. where I go, you're going to know I'm from New York. Yeah. And how about you, Carpa? Who was that little boy before all of this happened with the music and everything else? And you spin it a little bit, Carpo, too. So I'm gonna come back to you. You know, one of the interesting things that uh, it's, it's we just came from a one of the major events that everybody knows about the BET Awards. So this is a great time, and that must be him coming back in. Okay, he's coming in on another. Okay, he's coming in on a different one, Capo. I see you. So I'm gonna let you come on in. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I had to switch page for some reason. I'm blocked on that page. I don't even know why. That's great. Okay. The internet, you know, we know how the internet is. The algorithm, us, the algorithm, yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> so how about you, Capo? Tell us about the young little boy, Capo. Me, I was a, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, East New York, through the whole Brooklyn, really, but East New York, from Pink Houses to Linden Plaza, mm. that's my, and Cypress, Spring Creek, that whole, don't five, don't four or five build projects, that's me. Best uh, everywhere, but I really was a basketball player. I was outside playing basketball everywhere, from Brooklyn to West Fourth to Queens to every, everywhere in New York. You think about, it, I really played ball. And my my era of basketball, I was playing ball with Sebastian Telfair. Mm, That's okay. one of my one of what was one of my good friends. At fifteen, sixteen. I knew what it was to be around big name stars because Stephon Marbury had us in the club at 15, 16 with him. And being around that was like, whoa. So this is the life. This is wow. The, so that's so, that's what it was. I love I loved it. So let me ask you, gentlemen, you know, you came up in an era when we had all those great MCs, DJs, rap artists, you name it from New York City. So you were exposed before you even thought about it. Today, it's not quite like that. Today, it's a different kind of exposure. Can you talk about that for a minute? What's the difference between the exposure to the industry back in the day when y'all were coming up and the exposure to the industry now? Because it's, it's a whole different element now. Well, for me, it's uh, the difference is social media. You understand? Back then, you had to go on Video Music Box, Bobby, Bobby Simmons, uh, it's different sites, different things you had to go on to hear the new artists. You had to go to the Wiz to go buy that CD. You had mm. to go through your, your bootleg on the corner to go get the new mix, the newest mixtapes. Now, if you want to take it back to where we had to go record High 97, Funk Master Flex on the tape, then that's that's real hip-hop right there. That's, that's what I know. So the difference is it's really social media. It's so easier now. Easier, I can go pit. You can go pit out a song right now, and as long as you got a certain amount of followers, you are right right now. Wow! And now, how about you, Imani? From your perspective as a writer, what would you say to that? I think I think of um, just to piggyback off what Copper was saying, but then also the other part is um, we lost visionaries. You know, back in the days, you know, the DJ was the visionary before a song ever get, had a thousand spins. He could hear it and know, I right, this is the song that's going to go. Mm -hmm. And that was the essence of hip hop. You know, the DJ was the focal point. So once the visionaries was lost and once, you know, people stopped having foresight and, and stopped going ahead and vouching for people without social media, having to put their stamp without a million followers already, we kind of lost then. And then um, I always say on an artistic level, it's still out there. 
the only problem is that we lost putting our focus on that because you know the labels just feel it's more profitable to put focus on you know what 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 what's a quick fee so at this point investing in and ter taking a, a talent and really seeing it through and molding them and putting them through that artist development it no longer exists you're not going to get that so you know it's, it's a quick turnaround yeah, that artist development is definitely not there because back in the day, I know back in the 90s, I used to work with Sony and, you know, I used to do some things when people actually had a budget and when the new artist came out, you would send them on a promotional tour. And I had many of them that came through North Carolina and we did that. And now there's no more of that. Everybody's mm -hmm. on their own. There's no mm -hmm. budget, you know. So it's really sad. So, Kapo, let me ask you this. So you have an eye on the artist. You, you have that management cap on. So what do you look for as a manager when you're out there scouting for new artists? I listen for sound, what they talking about, they look, and they following. But suppose they don't have the following because they're brand new. They're brand new, and they got the sound. They have the sound. They have the look, but they don't have the following. Then you got to build. Then I build that brand around them. That's for me now, me and my team, CCMG, to come in and say, you know what, I right, this is what we're going to do for you. And this is how we're going to build around you and show you the things of how you're going to get the following. You got so, the vision, you got, you got the look, you got everything, but you just don't have that following. So we're going to push you, but we ain't going to push you. You got to get that following because if you don't have 100,000, if you don't get... If you put out a video and your video is only doing 900 views and your video been out for a year, that's not good. That's not good. You need to be getting at least 30,000 to 50,000 if you're a new artist. If, I, if I'm lying, bro, you can tap in because you, you put music out and you know that's, you know, you, we really should be getting wanting 100,000, but let's be honest, 30,000 yeah. to 50,000 is kind of, Reasonable. Yeah, yeah, I think the the, the struggle the struggle is um a a lot of a lot of kids. There's nothing wrong with having that following already set. You know, mm -hmm. the one the one thing that made you the dope the dope guy in high school was that you had the following in high school, and it wasn't because you forced yourself you know to go get that. You just happened to be the guy in high school that everybody liked, that everybody rocked with. So you built up a following. That that's how some guys became the homecoming king. That's a you know, and they need to treat the music industry and the social media aspect as the same. Like I told my nephew, um, you might not want to go to, he's a very popular kid in high school, homecoming kid. You might not want to go to college, right? And I understand that's not your route. You're a rapper. You want to become a rapper, this and this and that. But you know the game today is having a following. So why don't you do this? Go to college. Not for anything other than just the access to the people. Because you have a campus now where you can literally touch anybody at a moment. So even if you're really not there for the actual purpose of the diploma, the, 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 the goal, you're able to go ahead and tap into other resources. Now you're able to get on those campuses, do those college shows. And, you know, there's so many different ways you can build up your following and also in a natural way. Now you got other people who pay for it. Yeah, that's what, mm -hmm. You know, you still get whatever results you get, but... Like Capo was saying, you got it. You have to have it, and it's not um, the thing. The thing that artists lost touch of too is a manager like Capo is only going to put his time and energy into someone that's going to put just as much as time and energy mm -hmm. into their own stuff. Mm -hmm. You got to so, match the energy. You, you, you got to match, match it. it. You know. So, so let's talk about that. You both of you said following, and somebody put it in the comment about buying a following. If you buy, no, a no, she, she it, said. She said buying views. Buying views, that means on YouTube. So now, I'm going to say this. When you buy views, YouTube is set up now where when a person buy views, you'll see them, let's say today they put out a video, right? Mm -hmm. They video shoot up to 150,000. Then you go back tomorrow, they only down to 5,000. That's the views they bought. Well, that's YouTube. what I'm going to say. It tells yeah. on you after a while. It, it, it tells on you. If you buy a view or follow, it will tell on you. So you I, I, Listen, you. I have artists hitting me up all the time, right? So if you have 15,000 followers on Instagram, you should have anywhere from 10,000 to 15,000 views on each of your videos. That's just, that's what, that's real. And like he said, if you're not matching my, and if I'm, 
if your energy is, you know, I, I'm at the studio today, and then you don't go back to the studio for the next six months, what you want me to do for you? Yeah. So if I have an artist, if I have an artist that's like static, that's in the studio every other night, every other night straight after work, my focus is there. My other artist, Star uh, J Rock, he said, "Yo, bro, look, I want to focus on my family, but I want to be part of the team. I'm still gonna write. Any artist that needs something, I'm gonna write for them. I'm good. Cool. That's great." I understand you need to be a family man, but you cannot put your career on hold for your family. I have a family. Just now I said, yo, guys, I'm about to get in the interview. I need y'all to sit down. Certain things we got to put on hold in our life for this. If you really want your career, you got to put a lot of things on, on hold. Uh, do either one of you know somebody know Shank Shank? Seven four four seven. No, that sound familiar? Because I don't That's be it. I don't be dealing with people that I don't know. Because you no, know, no, no, Instagram, no. Be crazy. <laughs> Listen, no, 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 no. They so jump up there and do some craziness. Oh, shit, yeah, now, we just seen it all. Yeah, you talking about education? You know, a lot of artists now. There's a. There's a couple that have some doctors and everything, and that's kind of cool because it's setting the example that it's okay to have an education. It's okay because when you get up there on these stages, mm. you need to be able to talk. You need to be able to hold a decent conversation, you know. So let's talk about that for a minute. I'm what sorry. Do you I, recommend? I, yes, you want to I'm say happy something? you brought that up. Okay, so I know two, two of the artists that we're talking about is Waka Flocka and Nick Cannon, right? I know Waka Flocka personally. He actually went back to school. Nick Cannon actually went back to school. We've seen pictures. All these other guys, they just getting it because they say they give this money for these black colleges. Let's, let's, let's go back to school. I went back to school. I graduated from your college. It's not a problem with that. And education is not a problem. Let's go back to school. Let's put that in the air to tell these kids, yo, let's finish high school. All right, if you don't want to go to college, at least finish high school. That's what I tell my oldest son all the time that's 16 and my little brother at 17. Finish high school. Finish yeah, I, high school, I, I, and then you can do whatever. Yeah, I pick, I pick, I piggyback that. Um, I'll say this much. I think everyone has their they paths towards mm -hmm. success. Um, I know plenty of people who haven't graduated high school who are very successful mm -hmm. and I know some people you know who have and they're very successful and vice versa mm -hmm. so I just think um you have to you have to really understand your purpose and you have to really understand what it is that you're not just trying to get out of your career but just out of life mm -hmm. if if you're willing to struggle for 10 years where you can't eat the way you want you can't sleep the way you want and this and this and that and and all preparation to go for your goal who am I to tell you not to but the one thing you're not going to do is start complaining about, oh, man, I can't. That's the life you chose. That's the path you chose. So, you know, I know people, uh, a young lady, very talented lady. She's a nurse and she's also a vocalist and she also goes on tour. And she she's figured a way to juggle everything that made sense for her in her life. But then I know a guy who dropped out of high school and he made it. That's right. And well. So you just know, you never know. It's, it's it, all about it, I, I say it goes by they drive. You know what I mean? Not only that, not only that, but we are in a time, we are in an era where entrepreneurship is, is it. Everybody, mm -hmm. like we grew up and they said, go to school, get a degree, go get a job. Mm -hmm. you know, these children are not doing that today. I mean, you know, the millennials and all them below, they are ready to go out here and make it. You know, and it's okay, but if you don't get a degree, you need to read. Mm -hmm. Well, can I can, let me? I I say this to any any person who who not preaches. Well, yeah, who forces upon the idea of college, right? So let's look at what college looks like for for us as minorities. College automatically, unless you come in off scholarship, automatically comes in as debt. And debt at a young age, you're starting off with debt, mm -hmm. a debt that you don't even honestly understand. So I think the biggest thing we need to teach kids is, okay, if that's your path, financially, what does that look like? Are you prepared to take on that Sally Mae uh, payment every, every month? Uh, what are you going to college for? If you're going for something that's going to be actually profitable, are you going to actually, you know, be able to make 
enough money to where this makes sense to take four years of loans out. It's, 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 it's a process for everybody. I just think uh, we all have to understand how the world works, not just in music, but just uh, uh, society, period, how finance works for us, not just for people in general, as minorities, <laughs> what it does for us. So that's that, it. That, that's good. That's yeah. good. Now, Amani, let me ask you this. You, you've been exposed and you've tapped in and worked with a lot of different people from Tank, Trey Song, Genuine, Genuine, Patti LaBelle, you know, Rick Ross, the late Daryl Lambert. What would you say to the new artists out here to, to help them to put themselves in a position to be able to be at the right place at the right time to gain that access? Um, the, the interesting thing about, about my career, I'll say, is I was lucky enough. Well, I won't just say luck. Some of it is luck, and then some of it is really just positioning yourself. I made sure that whenever I had the moment to be around anybody, I did something well enough to where they would either talk about it, refer me to someone, or um, I would make sure I circle the same rooms enough so where people would consistently see me and I would become a fixture. So in New York, in my time, um, as a singer, there was a spot called Soul Cafe in yeah. Times Square. And it was owned by Malik Yoba and, you know, Lenny Green and would host it. And I was a young guy in there. It was for the older crowd. But I would go and just do the open mic nights every night, every night, every Sunday. I would go, 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 which led me to then going to Village Underground and then doing that every Sunday, every Sunday. And eventually I would keep seeing the same people there. And they would go, Yo, you kind of dope. Yo, let me tell you about this person. Then you'd be... You be, you be amazed at how many times you go to all these different spots and it's the same people there that at a point you feel like your family in the game. So uh, for me, it was really just working the rooms and knowing what rooms to work and knowing what people were actually about the business or who were really just there just to be there. You know, you, you get smoking, smoking mirrors, you end up in a room with a lot of people and it look like they know people and they might know people, but right. they might not know people for the right reasons. Right. So you got, now, you right. Now, know Kappa, to, hey, Kappa, right. when you get there and you see someone like him from a management perspective, what do you say to them? We try to grab them immediately. We want somebody like that. You know what I mean? Because that means that they are twinkling on everybody, uh, believe it or not. And so what? what's the conversation? When you come up on a new person like that, you see them in the village. You see them at the Soul Cafe. They sound good. They look good. They seem like they have a little everything you need. What What do you say? First thing, you, first the first thing I go with. First thing I ask always any artist: Are you managed? Because if you manage, then now let's talk. Let me talk to your manager. Let me holler at your manager because there's ways to go about that. But then if you ain't managed, you know, so do you have a team? That's the next question. No, all right, so listen, I'm part of CCMG. This is my, my label. I'm the manager for the team, and we want you part of it. You will come down tomorrow, come sit with us, we'll take you out to lunch, and you'll hear more. Wow. What about mentoring? Do you recommend any of these new artists have a mentor or someone training them? And do you ask them about who they're being mentored by? Um, sometimes you can see who they mentor by. When you hear how they, they rap or how they sing, you could be like, okay, I know who he was mentored by Trey. I could tell he Trey was a big influence. Or when you see a singer that sings, but dance, but still can hold that note. Oh, Michael Jackson and Chris Brown influenced you. And that was your mentors your whole life. That was That's who you watch. So, I, you know, for me, it's easier than a lot of other people. Wow. Um, can, can I, uh, to add yeah, to that, I, I grew up with mentors, right? But then as I got older, um, I hmm. wanted my mentors to now become my competitors, right? And not because I wanted to, to, to defeat them, like, because I didn't respect them, but because if I'm at your level and I look up to you that much, then I'm doing something right. So I try to tell people now, you know, you can have your mentors, but look for great competitors. Like, I know Drake respects Jay-Z, but Jay-Z 
and Drake are competitors. Yes. He looks, at, he looks right. at him every time they get on a record. You know, Prince and Michael Jackson, while we don't know what the real relationship was, they, I know they had a big respect for each other, but they were competitors because they both were at the yeah. same level. Yeah, bro, listen, I'm sorry to cut you off. I tell Static that all the time. I say, yo, if you ever do a feature with anybody, you got to kill them because, trust me, they think it is to kill you. Mm -hmm. That's how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be the best person on that track. Yeah. No matter if it's yours or not, go in. I said, listen, that Renegade, Eminem destroyed Jay-Z on that. And I'm a Jay-Z fanatic. But that's one song that we got to admit, you know? So Yeah. Have, have, have great competitors. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's, that's, you know, you can, you can be mentored by, the, by the, the bum on the block because he has some wisdom. But you ain't competing with him. You don't want to be him. You, you know, you can get knowledge from him and wisdom. But who you want to be is the guy that you're racing against. Now, someone posed a question in there for you, gentlemen. They said, how do you find new talent and where do you look? And they put a question mark, social media. Um, for me, it's not social media. I'm outside. I'm at all these talent show showcases. I'm in the clubs. I'm, out, I'm outside. So for me, that's what it is for me. Or if one of my artists come and say, yo, bro, look, take a look at this. Listen to this. I'm like, oh, all right. Who this? Or oh, is this artist that I know from around the way and he trying to get down with the team? All right, let's go. Let's go see him. Let's go see what he about. But you got to have at least five done songs, studio done songs for me. That's me. And after that fifth song, I want to hear you acapella. Yes, anybody, yes. Anybody, anybody can have five songs, but let me hear you acapella. Then let me put this beat on right here and let me hear you freestyle on it. Right. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I tell artists that all the time. Be ready all the time. And you have to be ready with a clean version, especially if you have a dirty version. Mm -hmm. Like Because if you want to be on the radio and do certain things, you have to be prepared. Have, have both would versions. Would you guys agree? Yes. Yes, for sure. For sure. You know, now I do have a question in regards to contracts and negotiations. A lot of people, they don't know how to negotiate for themselves. A lot of people think they want to be independent and by themselves, and they think that, you know, they're know-it-all. So if there's somebody out here now who feels like they don't need a manager because they're trying to do it by themselves, what would you say to that person? You don't. <laughs> but, you, yo, bro, let's keep it real. You don't need a manager. You just need a team. You, you you just need a team. You don't need a manager, but it'd be smart to really have a manager because it's always somebody out there that knows a little bit more about this game than you that have been doing this a little bit longer. Can I, I say I say this much? Um, for me, a manager isn't isn't someone that does something that I can't do, right? Because we can both have the same knowledge. I think a manager is important because I shouldn't have to do everything. I should be able that when I want to turn off the, the, the management switch and go straight creative mode, I can go to him and say, yo, I need you to take control of this shit on this side. So I always was taught that managers, you know, the, the concept of a manager when it comes to artists is the manager works for you, right? Right. But a lot of artists get taught the other way around because, mm -hmm. we, because we feel like if we don't have them, then we're not a real artist. So that's the first thing I would tell an artist. Make sure that your manager is working for you. That's one. You are the brand. You're the business. They need to be doing everything that's to your benefit. Secondly, after that, you have to get someone that, um, you know, who, can, who you can hold accountable and who can do the same and you're respected. You know, there's a young lady that said she needs a team. Um, uh, don't force it. You know, fine. You you can go looking, but you want believe. you want to you want to build your team naturally. Don't go out there yeah. and go. I need a team and don't just do hire that. people. Because uh, when you do that, that's when you get you get take, the people that's just in it for the money. And they take advantage of you. Now they take advantage of you. Do believe it or not, your team is around you. But you just didn't open your eyes to see your team. But trust me, they're there. The ones that actually, every time you put out a song, that share it everywhere, that's your team. 
that's need that's who you need to start on your team. Yo, I need you to be my my person that just do this for me. I need you to do this for me. And believe it, that's how you start your team. And and CCMG, I'm the manager. We got our DJ, Static's the artist. I got my A and R. Other than that, I have nothing else. And this Static Brothers is both is the DJ and the A and R, and it's me. So we're family. Can, can, can I can I just say Le, LeBron James is the perfect example of taking your your group of friends mm -hmm. and turning mm -hmm. that into a business, not just through LeBron. His mm -hmm. friend Maverick grew up with billionaire. They 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 all they all in a space where they they went through one person who had enough faith in them, and they didn't come into the game with the knowledge. They went and got it. Mm -hmm. So you know sometimes you have people around like that. They might be you know little cousin that wanted. You know, want to help? Yo, listen, little cuz, go find out how to how to work the graphic design thing, and then come back. You know that that's mm -hmm. a team. Mm -hmm. Build now, together. Wow. Now, Imani, you you are a writer, so let's talk mm -hmm. about that for a moment. What are you looking for when someone comes to you and they want you to write for them? What do they need to come with besides a vision? What kind of questions are you going to ask them? If there's somebody out here right now that they need some help because they have the gift, but they just, they can't write. So they want some material. What would you say to them? So there's two two spectrums of it. The first spectrum is if I'm closely involved in it and it's, you know, something like a passion project, I'm going to want to sit and talk with you. I need to I need to see your energy, see your vibe. I need to see, um, you know, I might ask you questions about your past, you know, ask you questions about relationships, different things like that. Because I want whatever mm -hmm. I write to be real to you. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to just write something general that anybody can go sing. Um, then the second situation, if I'm just being commissioned to go pay something, I want to just hear your tone. How, how do you sound? Because now I need to know, writing style-wise, what suits you more, that's more tailor-made for you. Because I know what sounds good on me and what might sound good on, you know, Chris Brown or Usher or something like that. But who are you? What, what's going to stand out about this record? And people are going to say, oh, that was that guy singing that. Not just, you know, the, the problem with songs is that some songs are so great that they're greater than the artist. Mm. And the artist becomes forgettable. And, so, with, and would that be because maybe they don't know what style they are? I mean, should they know what their style is. So when they come to a manager or when they go to someone who's writing, they need to be able to articulate what their style is. Most most artists most artists don't take the time to really find out who they are or who they're becoming. You just you just understand you have talent and that's great, but you don't understand how to nurture that talent or how to develop the talent. So that's the biggest thing. I try to find out what's your lane, what's your sound, and find out what you're trying to do with it. And then you can go and move to the next parts. Now, couple, let's talk about your artists right now. Who do we have right now? And what's going on with the artists that you have right now? Um, as for me right now, I have Static G's. That's who my I'm focused on. Um, Static G's have I want a video out right now on YouTube, doing very well in the span of two weeks. We doing great numbers. Um, we got two songs that we're about to drop. We doing a video tomorrow, actually, at the pool party that we having. He's performing at the pool party tomorrow in Maryland. Um, we have a show that's coming up in Cleveland. We just really trying to really get out there. We're on a radio station out here in the DMV, heavy, 93.9, 107.9. So we actually, we doing some numbers out here on, on, and on this side. That's really good. So let's talk about that for a moment. A lot of artists... They they're hanging out with their crew, they're doing everything, but they're not they're not getting the gigs. They're not going out. They're not they're not being seen. What would you gentlemen recommend to help them to get more exposure to go out? And would you recommend that they go out and do some things for free so they can have that visibility? Yeah. Do as much as you can for free. You're free, yeah. Yeah. Build favors. Build build favors. Um, not just favors. Uh, build up a reputation of that you're going to deliver no matter what. Mm -hmm. So that when it comes time for that budget to get open, they'll open it. Like, oh, you know what? You done did about three, four shows for me for free. You've been dope each time and you're starting to bring out a crowd. Yo, listen, what what numbers we talking? So yeah, do do everything. Do everything possible that, that's on brand with what you're doing. 
Now, if they don't have any supervision or anybody guiding them, how would you advise them to figure out what to charge? Um, you know, to be honest, I think that's 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 just a matter of being realistic. You got to be realistic with yourself. You know, you're beginning in this game. Uh, you can't be – ain't nobody going to pay you $5,000 to step on those stage and ain't never seen you do nothing before. You know, uh, in all honesty, I couldn't give – I couldn't give a clear – like, because I'm not going to tell somebody what they work, you know. But still, no, but is there a formula that you would recommend – some type of formula. How would you help someone that has no direction? And what you got it. All right. So this is how I do it. If we book in the show, right? Say I book a show at BB Kings, right? BB Kings, you know, as an artist, you're not getting paid. They're not paying you. You have to sell tickets. Majority of any show that you do in the New York field, you got to sell tickets. So now. Some places is you get 50-50, you give that to the, the promoter, or sometimes your ticket sales is yours. It's your paper. You get, you get 10 tickets to sell. If you sell all 10, you get, a, you get as many tickets you can sell. That's, that's the thing. You, you, that's what you want to do. You want to sell 30 tickets. Even if 30 people don't come, you sold 30 tickets. So now that, that promoter know, okay, yo, Cabo sold 30 tickets the last time he was here. So that means if I get a bigger room, he might be able to bring 40, 50, just sell 40, 50 tickets. That's cool. That's his money. But people's coming out to my shows off of him. So now we both building a name off each other, and we both making bread together. So that's how you get close to some promoters. And, and what should they be aware of out here in the industry? The industry can be cutthroat, too. So uh, could you gentlemen shed light on some things that people should – kind of stay away from and some red flags out there when it comes to people approaching them, if you know, associating themselves with the wrong people in the industry. Um, I'll say I'll say the one thing that I've I've always had discomfort with is people who are who are um too too quick in in matters of contract, right? And what I mean by too quick meaning we've done nothing. We've done nothing. You've shown me nothing. You've presented me with nothing. Um, and yet you want to sell me on this idea of, yo, before we can do something, I need to go ahead and, you know, sign this paper. No, no. Um, even in the music business, even in the big buildings, mm -hmm. I've had relationships with people in the buildings where I've never signed a contract and we were exchanging money. We were, you know, putting me on a different thing, studio sessions, whatever. When people rock with you, they rock with you. When they want to see you successful, they, they rock with you. And, and when they know that you're actually someone that can bring them something, they'll, they'll put the real effort into building a real rapport with you. So I tell people all the time, build a real rapport with the people you want to do business with. Because those are the people that you're relying to stay to their word. And this is a business where people don't normally stay to their word. So if you, if you, if you have some, some level of honor in you, you'll honor that word without even the contract. So that that's the biggest thing. Just just look out for character and read. It's, it, it's it's a book out there for everything you need to know about this country. Contracts, actual music theory, uh, vocal theory, computer th everything. This is every book for everything. So yeah, I think that's that's big. Mm -hmm. So Kapo, what would you tell? Same question. What, Same what would be a red flag? The same thing, but you know, the more it, for the rap game, it's different because it's more of everybody want to be independent, so it's not they're not really looking for that. So now for R and B, for R and B singer or a pop singer, is different because for a male, a male can see it, they can see it. But for a female, a guy can come and say, "Yo, listen, your voice is beautiful. I know by to by tomorrow, I can give you a million dollars. I can give you. I can do this. I can do this." Now, some of them might be true, but some of them might just be trying to get in your drink, your jeans, and you gotta, you just gotta see the snakes. There's a lot of snakes in the grass in the industry, and they're gonna show you who they are. They're gonna show yeah. you who they your are. Your eyes always gotta be open. So let me ask you this: If you knew 
back when you started, what you know now, gentlemen, what would you do different? <laughs> I would have signed. I would have signed a couple of more contracts. To be honest, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I, back in the days, I um, there was a lot of opportunities in front of me that I was leery about, and I have a lot of friends in the in the industry that signed some bad contracts. But the great thing about it is that it got them in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it got them in those doors. And then they made out of it what they needed to make out of it. You know, the one thing one of my friends told me, he said, I've never seen a contract that I can't renegotiate. Like, I'm going to raise like my that. worth. I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I like that. You know, so there's been moments where, you know, I had things in front of the table. And I was like, nah. Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm being smarter than everybody else in the room. Like, I'm, I ain't about to go ahead and get jerked. There's a lot of people in this industry who have great legacies who have been jerked. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. part of the process. That's and part it's of the a process. part of the process. It's a part of the hit. So, you know, you want to be, you know, you want to be Larry, but sometimes these opportunities only come one one time and you got to yeah. take a chance and you got to make the best out of it. So, you know, I definitely would have took a little more, a couple of more chances. Thanks. Now, what is it that if you knew then what you knew now, you would do different, couple. The same thing. I would have took them opportunities when guys wanted me to go on tour with them. But just because of their reputation of the street stuff, I said, nah. You know, I always stuck with my gut. Sometimes nothing happened, but sometimes some things did happen. But now I would have been like, yo, you know what? It is what it is. I know how to eliminate myself from the situation if something crazy about to happen. But that's it. But I really wish I did to go on a lot of tours that I could have went on. But I'm happy I didn't because I've seen a lot of my boys come back head slash head hit in the head with bottles and wow. Yeah. Well, let me, now let, now you said something, Imani. You said being able to renegotiate. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that a minute. How important is that? Like knowing your worth and knowing. That it's okay to ask. It's okay to say no and to say, no, I don't want that. I, I This is what you need to give me, and this is why. You have to know your skill, your background, and you have to be able to sell yourself. You have to be confident. Let's talk about the confidence level that these artists need to have when they do go out and talk to people. You need to, you need to walk in a building like you are bigger than Drake and Nicki Minaj. You're bigger than them. You need to walk in there with that confidence. You need to have that confidence. When you walk past somebody, you need to walk and say, dang, who is that? Walk in these places. Because when they see us, they're already intimidated by us. But now when you walk, yeah, bro, yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I was going to just say um, getting getting the deal is like the easiest step. Mm -hmm. You know, keeping the deal is, is oh. <laughs> the hardest thing. And then being successful. <laughs> It's like the whole nother, another world. So I think people people need to understand that when you get on these labels, you get into these contracts, it's not like a weight off your back. The pressure is really like starts at that point. Because now you have to deliver no matter what. You have to deliver whether they get on, on point, whether the label supports you. You have to now raise your stock. And there's going to be moments where the label ain't thinking about you. It's going to be moments where your lawyer ain't picking up the phone because he, he's working with someone else who's bigger. And you got to figure a way, how do I raise my stock for them to have that same priority with me? Mm -hmm. How do I raise my stock to where this 360 deal that I signed, that this next go around when I need to renegotiate and, and, and go ahead and ask for a better contract and really, y'all want to try to get my master's back and all that? What have I done to where they still want to do that level of business with me. And a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people get very laxed once they get into a contract because mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. feel like that's the success. Yo, I made it. Like, nah, like everybody gets a contract. Mm -hmm. I, have, I, have, I have at least four to five friends that have been signed to damn near every label that you could think of. And you've never heard a record of this. Wow. Because they got comfortable with the fact that they signed. Because and sometimes, sometimes just wow. going back home and screaming to your people, you're more wanna, 
I'm on so that sometimes that's just the mission. Oh, and, oh, that's a fact. So now, Imani, talk about that feeling when you had your Grammy nomination and what it takes to be recognized to get a Grammy in any category in case someone is aspiring to do that. Uh, you know what's so funny? It happened. It happened the way that I knew it would happen the first time. And it was through hip hop. So anybody familiar with me, my, my upbringing musically, my very first signs of success and people seeing me was, was through hip hop artists. Uh, hip hop artists would hit me up. Yo, I need a hook. Yo, can you help me with this, this, and this, and this, and that. And um, when I first moved to LA, I took about four to five years off of music. I wasn't sending out no records. I wasn't putting out no music. And one of my, my friends, uh, Royster59, hits me up. Like, yo, bro, I need you to help me with this joint. I, I heard you in mine, and I'm on the phone. I'm like, yo, I ain't gonna lie. I'm not really, not really in the mood <laughs> to, to do music. And he said, trust me, bro. This is, this, is, this is gonna be dope. I went into it with no thought. Went to it with no thought, just did it, sent it back. And um, after doing it, and then after hearing his album, I was like, yo, I feel like this is going to do something wasn't the biggest promoted album. It wasn't, you know, anything like that. But it, it just felt right. It just felt like, oh, you know what? This is the moment where I'm supposed to get some level of flowers back. And uh, that was the moment. The album was nominated for a Grammy. The song I wrote was on it. It's a Grammy nomination. And it kind of got me back into my groove. I was like, oh, you know what? Yeah, this 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 is late, but it, it's never too late. You know what wow. I mean? Wow. So congr congratulations. So what next? What are you aspiring for next? What's the next level for you? Uh, the next level for me, honestly, in music, I've reached. I got back to it. I'm having fun again. Mm. I stopped having fun when I was making, making music back then. So I told myself, I'm going to go back to doing music from my first original moments of doing it, which was I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Um, and that's it. You know, other things that I do in entertainment, as far as on the media side, anything like that, that's what I do with the hopes of finance riches and things like that. Not saying that I'm ever closing the door down from reaching that with the music, mm -hmm. but um, that's not my goal anymore. I just want to have fun. I, I want to leave the studio and be happy, like I, how I used to be, and know that when people hear it, they're going to enjoy it too, even if it's just 500. If it's 500, cool. If it's 500,000, even better. But... I'm not I'm not I'm not searching for a uh, financial gratification off of music anymore. So right. uh, can I can I ask you so you know Uh-huh, go ahead. Sidebar. So next week are you in New York right now, bro? Yeah, I leave Wednesday though. When are you coming <laughs> back, bro? <laughs> I I I'll be I'll be gone for like a month, but I right, when you get back, uh, I I want to say, you know what I mean? Let's you know it. how we already talk, but I just got something to like last night, like one in the morning, and, and I just talked to Static, and we was like, "Yeah, so yeah, send it over. It. yeah, I'm gonna send it over. I got you." So, Kapo, what next for you, and what are you aspiring to do? What What are you pushing your artists to do? We just trying to we trying to make it really mainstream, now, you know. And I'm not trying to piggyback off my friends that's in the industry, so that's the good thing about me. We're going to do this. We're going to do this from the ground up and, and and win. So I just really want us to get mainstream now. You know, like I said, we're doing great in the DMV area. It's just like something with New York. The hate is so real. You got to pay these DJs $5,000 just to spend your song. Well, and you know, that's crazy. Payola. Yeah, <laughs> listen, but you it's know what? Truth. That's a biblical thing. Uh, they say, you know, you never get honored where you're at. You have to go outside in your neighborhood to be recognized and appreciated. That's how it is in every industry and everything you do. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't surprise me at Crystal, all. That's, Crystal, that, that's, that's the story of my R&B career. I am appreciated to every hip-hop legend. I've worked with most most of them. I've sat in rooms with all of them. They all respect me as not just the guy who does records with them, but they respect my R&B. But yet when it comes to that R&B world, it's like 
the 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 black sheep. I think I think when you when you go down a certain path that differs from the other guys, it's not well respected. So I've always felt like that as a as a as an R and B and I'm an R and B singer. Like I'm a singer. So, yeah. So wow. it hurts sometimes when I'm like, yo, my community ain't really pushing like I want, but I can go on all hip hop. I can go on Source, and I can go on, and I can get all the love in the world. Okay, cool. Well, I'm gonna go rock with them, and you know I'll see the rest of you R&B niggas later. You wow. know, that's, I'm sorry, bro, but that's that light skin beef. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's that, that's that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that you're not chasing the money because a lot of times people don't know if you're happy, the money will come. You know, I want to ask you guys a couple more questions before we bring to a close. I want to respect your time. What is the greatest piece of advice that you receive and from who regarding this industry? What has changed your whole perspective and helped you to get where you are? What piece of advice and who was it? Mm. I got <laughs> I got it. And I, and, I, and I walk with this every time and I remember it as a kid. We, um, and it wasn't advice given directly to me. It was given to the room of kids. I was in a boys choir of Harlem and we were recording vocals for uh, Kanye West's uh, Two Words. It's a record with Kanye West featuring uh, Freeway and Most Deaf. And he was just talking, just talking aloud. This is 2000, no, this is not even, yeah, it's like 2001-ish, two-ish. He's just talking out loud, talking. And he said, yo, kids, when it come to this music, don't take nobody advice. Do you? It's never wrong. It's, music is never wrong. It's what is what you want it to be. So I take that with me all the time when I'm in the studio. Now I like criticism. I I, I do take you know. I don't I don't I don't want. I hate when people come with um a complaint without a solution. Mm. So if you're gonna give me some criticism, tell me how to fix it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I don't want your advice. Mm -hmm. I don't want your advice. I'm gonna go through this life the way I. Me personally, I'm supposed to go through it. So that was the, that was that was the best piece I've, I've ever done. That's, That's it. Follow your heart. How about you, Capo? For me, it would have to came from my uh, my mom's when she told me that you're gonna hear a million no's hit before you hear that yes. Don't let that detour you from your dream. Keep going for it. So. That stays with me every day, you know what I mean? And that's how I teach my kids. You're going to hear a million no's before you hear that yes. But when you hear that yes, keep pushing because you're going to get a million more yeses after that. Because no just means not now. That's all it means. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. it's not now. You know, it, it wasn't your time. Just go back and do what you need to do, and that's it. You know? And sometimes all you need is that one yes. Mm -hmm. When that one yes, you... Changes your life. Yeah. So I want to ask you this, this last question before I allow you guys to give your closing comments. A lot of people make the mistake of when they when they do get that break, they want to take people with them. You know, when they when they get that 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 backstage pass or they get that invitation to go somewhere, and then they trying to bring people with them, and they don't understand that access is just for you. You can't take everybody with you every time because they'll mess you up. Can you talk about that for a minute? Like I said. As a crew, my crew is only four of us. Static just told me the other day, I was just talking to him about financing, and I said, yo, bro, you know, when you start getting these features, people want you to do features, you got to start charging them now. So he like, yo, bro, you know, for three other people, three people, I can't charge them, bro. They share my stuff. They show me love. They come out to my events, and I'm like, you know what? Those are the ones that could come out to give those backstage passes to those when we go to the award shows they can come they can come with us because they, we know they're not going to act the ass but then when we go to the source awards we can bring the ones from the block the hundred guys from the block and all that and certain stuff you know who to bring and when not to bring them truthfully yeah my my thing is uh, I tell people uh that's that's always at my own discretion cuz I can't take my mom and my kids everywhere and and they they're more important than anybody who's going to come to the table talking about bring me to something. So if they got to understand you got to understand. This ain't about you. This is about you know a path that I'm on. Uh, 
homie said you wasn't with me shooting in the gym. You were, yeah. You're not in the studio recording these records. You're not. You, now, unless you on that level, unless you know you putting in, you got some level of business to do with this. Yeah, there's priority to make sure that you're there. But other than that, don't 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 expect don't 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 tell yourself that I have to do this. Mm -hmm. I do it at my own discretion, and because it's at my own discretion, I get to use it at my own discretion. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them also, like when you get in the room, I mean, do your research if you're going to see somebody. Do your research so you can ask the right questions and know who you're talking to. You know, sound like you actually want to be there you know mm -hmm. like you said before about matching the energy if you come mm -hmm. in there unprepared then i can want to deal with you you know and image i i, I want to touch on image for a minute because in the hip-hop and in the music industry image has changed today it's not like it used to be today anything goes but you still have to have a certain persona about yourself can you talk about that for a minute because even though styles have changed with fashion there's still a level of self-respect that you have to have when you walk in a room and especially if you're representing a manager a company or you're trying to approach an artist um, could you talk about that for one second i mean my mama my grandmama always told me whenever you're going out you step out and you look good so that's it for me like so whenever i go out like i know miss crystal you didn't think i was gonna have no collar shirt on you know me from Gina thing, you know, from having T-shirts, you know. Nah, it's, this is a professional setting. I know how to change. You see how I was dressed. I was actually going to artist events. When I go to artist events, that's how I dress. Oh, you I knew know. that. I, I, was, I, wasn't even, I already knew that. I mean, I know you, you're professional, so you know what to yeah. do. But for some young children, is it hard to drill that in their head, though? Yeah. I got a 10 year old. Yeah. I got a 11 year old. And I try to tell them, you listen, when you go to school, you got to look good. Why are you going out with your pants looking one one leg higher than the other, your shirt looking like this? <laughs> no, you, you, I said, when I go outside, you see how I look. My shirt is on my shoulders. My pants is up over my waist. My boxes is not showing. I said, that's not cute. That's not something we do. So, you know, that it do goes down. Yeah, for art, for, for, for artists, uh, I try to stress to... to um, Whatever, whatever your image is, whatever it is the image that you're trying to get off, know exactly what it is that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can you can dress you can dress a mannequin up and, and be, it could be a fly mannequin, but mm -hmm. it's still gonna be stiff. It ain't gonna know how to swag it out. It ain't gonna know how to move. So, a lot of a lot, there's a difference between being a mannequin and, and just having a, a, mm -hmm. a style about yourself and a grace. I've seen people go outside with a t-shirt. And short to on and just it make you look good. It just make you look. It, it's just something Swag about it. them. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So I, that's I agree. I agree. And, and and if I may say this, know who you are going to see. Like if you're going to a fashion designer, then you need to look a certain way. What look do they want? Know what they're looking for. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to a particular company. You got to do your research. It goes back to the research again, because if they're looking for a certain look, that's the look you need to give them when you walk through the door, because if you uh -huh. don't, they, they're not looking at you. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, I would love to keep going, but I know you may have something to do, and I do too. I would love for you to just give any closing comments. I've been asking you questions the whole time, but I would love for you to just say anything at this time that's on your heart. Let the people know how they can reach you, uh, if you have any projects coming up, Anything that's on your heart that you want to say regarding an event or product or anything like that, and any closing comments. And I'll start with you, Capo. Well, uh, for me, you know, I have my clothing brand, Cool for Life, that I'm a brand ambassador for. The store's in Brooklyn on Malcolm X and Lexington. You go there right now. My partner, he's actually everywhere in Brooklyn and Best of Pepper Stuyvesant right now selling it. Our stuff is in the Barclay Center. The Barclay dancers actually wore it during a play, during a playoff run and everything. So um, then, you know, we got Static G's. We just did a remix to the Forget Me Nots. Mm. So that's going to be dropping real soon. And then, of course, we got the pool party tomorrow in Maryland. That's going to be really so your company is doing a pool party. Oh, that's going to be nice. Your artist yes. is performing. Oh, that's going to be real cool. Yes. So if somebody wants to book your artist, how can they reach you? 
uh, at my email, ccmg533 at gmail.com or straight here on C CCMG Capo or CCMG Capo 5 on Instagram. I'm I'm not hard. <laughs> I will put my number out, but I'm not doing that. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay.